Hello and welcome to today's Control Global webinar on how to keep your control cabinets and the electronics inside them cool, clean, and operational. My name is Keith Larson. I'm Editor-in-Chief of Control Magazine and ControlGlobal.com. I appreciate your taking the time to join us today. Our webinar today is sponsored by Advanced Cooling Technologies, or you'll hear us refer to it as AC, or ACT for short, a provider of premier thermal management solutions across a broad range of markets, from spacecraft to military vehicles to medical devices and of special interest today, industrial enclosures. But we're, before we get started with today's webinar, allow me to take care of a few housekeeping items. Um, on your screen, you should see several primary sections. Um, the upper left, or audio box, where you now see images of me and today's presenters, allows you to adjust the volume of this presentation. Just hover over this section until you see the audio volume control and adjust the volume to your, your preference. At the right in the largest section is where today's presentation slides will be. Um, and under that window, you will see a chat section where you can chat live with fellow audience members. So those chats there go out to the entire audience. At the left side of the slide window is ask a question box. And I really encourage you to as we go through the presentation today, um, when questions come to mind, just type them in there, and then we will get to those at the end of the presentation here today. If you Also, if you do have a problem with uh, the presentation or have questions for tech support, you can ask questions in that box as well. Um, below that is a box with several tabs where you can read more about today's speakers, as well as download a PDF version of today's presentation and a couple of other um, background materials from our sponsor organization. And finally, across the bottom of the screen, there should be icons for additional features. By hovering over each icon, information about the icon will be displayed. If you want to enlarge a particular content box, you can enlarge it by clicking on the rectangle in the top right corner. Um, and if you accidentally close out of a section, you can get, get it back by clicking the Restore button at the bottom of the screen, the, one, uh, the icon to the very left that looks like an arrow chasing its tail. So that'll bring everything back, but you can also maximize uh, the content during the presentation itself. This webinar will be archived, and we encourage you to direct your coworkers to the final recorded pre presentation when we're done. And finally, at the end of the presentation, please stay tuned for a very brief survey that will give us feedback um, that we need to improve our webinars in the future. So now on to the main event. Um, joining us today, real, it's my pleasure to, to, to introduce Brian Muzika. He's a business development manager for ACT. He has first-hand experience working with customers to optimize solutions involving heat pipes, phase change materials, liquid cold plates, and pump two-phase cooling systems. He's a mechanical engineer by training and worked as an R&D engineer for ACT's aerospace products group before taking on his current business development role. Outside of work, he enjoys spending time with his family and traveling, and I suspect he probably does more of the first and less of the second nowadays. So welcome, Brian. Pleased to have you. Uh, are you there? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Keith. He's probably muted. And we also have uh, uh, waiting in the wings to help join in uh, when we get to the Q&A section of the, of the presentation is Scott Garner, Vice President and Manager of the Industrial Products Group within ACT. He has more than 30 years' experience in the field of heat transfer and thermal management and experience in both engineering and management in technology development, product development, and sales and marketing. He's an inventor on 14 patents and has written a variety of technical publications. Welcome, Scott. Appreciate you joining us as well. Hi. Thanks for the introduction. Oh, absolutely. Well, uh, the, with the introductions being uh, given, I will turn this over to Brian, and I will let you, uh, you take the call from here. Thank you, Keith. Uh, appreciate the introduction to both myself and ACT, and I also want to thank everyone out there for, for joining us. I know it's a very challenging time right now, so we really we really value your participation in this webinar. So as Keith mentioned, um, please include as many questions as you can. If we don't have time to cover anything at the Q&A, we'll certainly um, we promise that we'll get your response back as, as quick as possible. And just because of our first uh, webinar with control just to build on some of the background at ACT as, as Keith mentioned we are a, a highly engineered custom solutions provider in the in the thermal management area um, with kind of notoriety in some of the medical platforms um, we're on, on fighter jets as well as on orbit in space so that custom 
expertise that we kind of provide led us to this market. Um, but we also found the need here in the industrial um, electronics cabinets to provide a combination of um, standard product offerings as well as customized options. So that's what we're going to try to go through today and try to add as much value as we can to, to the audience out there. But anything not covered, uh, again, please, please ask questions and we'll make sure to get to a response as quick as possible. So today what we'll be talking about is electronic um, enclosures or cabinets that we need to keep cool. So we'll talk about why that's important, some of the industry trends that are driving thermal performance. We'll talk about the product or technology options. Um, and we're going to focus a lot on the sealed enclosure cooling options, mainly because they add to the growing need of high reliability. Um, and with each technology offering, we'll also talk about some customization available to hopefully give you some de design ideas as you're um, working through the, the thermal design portion of your cabinet. And finally, we'll end with some online resources. And I believe these slides are available to, uh, to download on this platform. So those can be one click away, but we'll also send them out afterwards as well. So talking about some of the um, modern industrial enclosures, there's mainly two, two areas where these can be seen. And um, they, they can honestly be seen everywhere from um, most factories that are running automation equipment to outdoors at amusement parks and golf courses. These, these basically run a lot of the things that we rely on for everyday life. Um, but with that, there's, there's a lot of drive for um, higher performance and higher reliability. So whether it's the environment they're going into indoor with, with dust and particulates or outdoor with um, climate and weather to deal with or the growing power densities, um, these, these things are becoming more and more critical to, to keep cool and keep operational. So there's three kind of big trends going on or, or three big keys to the thermal management solution that you're going to be investigating. Um, the first one is the increasing power density that I alluded to earlier. So <clears throat> here, because these, these control cabinets or electronics enclosures are demanding higher performance, um, the electronics are becoming more and more capable. They're um, running quicker. And with that, you're getting more and more waste heat. So the overall growth in the power requirements involved in these systems is trending upward, which makes puts more onus on the thermal management technology that, that's going into these systems. The second is kind of a, an offshoot of that, but with the advanced capability of a lot of these electronics, the cost is increasing of the electronic components themselves. That spurs the need for a much higher reliability from the thermal solution because you no longer want to replace these um, entire cabinets or specific component, electronics components um, routinely. You want them to long, live as long as they possible so you can get a good financial return on your electronics investment. And the, the final thing that's, that's growing a need for more um, investment into thermal is the um, amount of harsh environments that they're going into. So you need not only them to survive those environments, but live up to higher ambient conditions um, and, and harsh environments out there. So as I, I mentioned earlier, these are these type of control cabinets, as, as you are all aware, are involved in a lot of different industries and can be found in a lot of different places. Some of the ones that are, are driving some of the high thermal performance, we've listed there, industrial process control and automation equipment, um, petrochemical applications, telecommunication with the, the speed in, in receiving and transmitting data, um, food processing, defense electronics, um, and transportation, we've seen a lot of interest as well, both in the rail and electric vehicle markets. So from an engineering consideration, these are basically the inputs we'd be looking for from a thermal perspective to, to talk to your system. So <clears throat> the first one is the, the physical size of the enclosure and where it's going in, into your um, into your space. So what surfaces are available for us to mount the thermal solution, but also what surfaces are exposed. So if you're mounting in a corner or against a wall, it might have slightly different performance than if it were completely open at all surfaces. The second is the, the environment. So uh, we'll talk through some of the, the ratings that the industry has put on, on the environmental conditions, um, but that's a big portion of, of what the ultimate solution is going to look like. 
The, the next couple are probably the most important from a thermal perspective. Um, the first is the total amount of waste heat that you need to reject from, from your thermal solution. And the next two are both um, temperature requirements. So one, the um, ambient temperature condition. So outside of your electronics enclosure, what the, the temperature condition is out there. And the second is the temperature condition inside to safely operate all your electronics. So whether that's the case temperature of your electronics or the air temperature to allow for temperature rise in the uh, cabinet itself, that, that is a requirement that we need to kind of thoroughly understand to correctly size your, your heat sink. And the final um, engineering consideration the, is the elect <coughs> electrical configuration, but um, most of these options can adhere to, to any electrical consideration. So jumping into the environment, um, the good news here is that a lot of the, the industry has standardized the environmental requirements into ratings. So there's both the NEMA and IP ratings associated with a lot of these electronics enclosures and ultimately the thermal management solution. So um, going through a couple of the, the predominant ones that we see in the industry, the <clears throat> NEMA 12 is, is for indoor dust tight. The NEMA 4 is indoor or outdoor and um, needs to survive direct spray. The NEMA 4X is probably the one that we find uh, our customers prefer the most is the same as before, but also needs to be um, corrosion resistant. So material selection needs to account for corrosion ability. And <clears throat> finally, the, the 3R, which is similar to the 12, but it has a rain hood. So it, it's not protected against direct spray, but uh, against outdoor rain environment. So with that, I think we'll take a pause to kind of see what you guys are seeing in terms of environmental conditions in your system. Yeah, we're, um, if, the, if we'll advance the slide once more. This is the interactive poll, and we really wanted to do is find, uh, just to calibrate the presentation, what kind of enclosure cooling you as our audience um, are using most often. Um, there's uh, four different options and then a secret other. <laughs> um, but it's really talking about what types of enclosures uh, you use most often, whether it's A, uh, the NEMA uh, 12, as, as uh, Brian had just described, NEMA 4 or 4X, uh, B and C, as well as if you do not currently use enclosure um, coolers and are investigating these in, in, a, in, in a broader context just to find out um, more about it. Anything else to um, differentiate these, Brian, from your perspective or um, uh, to inform their selections in the poll? No, no, and I think we're getting some, some pretty good responses here. So it's, it's good to, okay. uh, to see people participating. And looks like so far it's close, but um, I, I said the 4X is what we've seen the most, and it looks like that's leading so far. So All we'll right. give it maybe well, a couple, you... couple seconds to <clears throat> let everyone get their response in. Yeah. So if you're voting for NEMA 4, you've got time to <laughs> uh, move the needle um, uh, on, on the poll. All right. Well, I think um, things have stabilized pretty well. Uh, do you want to advance the slide once more? Then we can share all these results uh, with, with the audience. Um, what do you think? NEMA 4X seems to be uh, carrying the day, uh, followed by NEMA 4 and NEMA 12, and then you know, smaller, smaller number of people that either don't use an enclosure cooler or, um, or ha have some other requirements. Uh, any surprise? Uh, are you surprised by, the, uh, by that um, relative share of, of audience? No, no. I, th I think it's uh, good feedback, somewhat as we expected. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think a lot of, a lot of these um, voters probably also experience a lot of variety in, in what their requirements are, so probably just didn't have one choice that, that fit all. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, thanks for thanks for voting there. We have one more poll coming up after this slide. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, thanks for thanks for voting. The uh, the next consideration we're going to talk about is uh, total waste heat. So this is one of the engineering considerations we we covered, and basically this is a sum of all your various components in in your enclosure. So in most cases, the electronics manufacturer will provide a data sheet which will either have an efficiency or an overall waste heat number that you can use 
Um, but summing up all those and understanding exactly the total number of waste heat is, is important in these systems when you're, when you're trying to select a thermal solution. So I think with that, before we get into um, some of the exact options for, for enclosure cooling, we'll, we'll do one more poll. All right, we're going to go to the next page. This is a poll now. So if you have a sense, so you've got some two different, there were three different um, choices of um, ambient, above ambient cooling. So two of them that are, are sealed, and then um, one uh, with the fan filter option uh, for cooling. And we've also got two different um, power, power ratings, less than 1,000 watts and more than 1,000 watts for your, your typical enclosure. And then, of course, we've got um, two additional options um, for below ambient um, cooling. Uh, do you want to qualify how, how, what, what's meant by below ambient there, Brian, uh, for, for the audience and sub ambient in the last two options? Yeah, we'll actually talk through this a little more on the, on the next slide. But um, okay. essentially, above ambient is, is where your outside air temperature is below your requirement for your internal air mm -hmm. temperature. So you can rely right. on, um, on on above ambient cooling. And, and sub-ambient just means you need to condition your air prior um, to, to reaching the cabinet. OK. All right, we have responses coming in still. All right, option A seems to be pulling pulling the most uh, the most responses so far. Traditional sure. fan filter people uh, with not sealed enclosures. Which, of course, if it if, if it makes sense, then that's probably the most mm -hmm. economical version. But, uh, um, do you want to? I think we're probably seems to be stabilizing now. If you want to advance, and then we can talk about share the results with everybody. Um, again, the ambient. Fan filter combination um, certainly was the, the, the highest rank, followed by the two sealed options, and then the obviously the D and E um, below ambient. Probably just just a little more unusual applications um, where you've got uh, uh, aren't, aren't able to draw in that ambient air. Surprise you uh, in terms of these ratings at all, Brian, or any comment on on these? Um, yeah, I think the, the fan filter combination, I, I think, is the most economical, so it doesn't surprise that mm -hmm. whenever you can get away with that, you, you go with it. But uh, it was good to see the above ambient options winning out, because that is, is certainly going to be the focus of, of this presentation, and we'll just mm -hmm. kind of slightly touch on the, the sub-ambient options. Um, okay. But just looking at the technologies here um, on the next slide, the fan filter and sealed enclosure cooler are the two primary above ambient options that, that are used in the industry. And then the sub-ambient options, there's there's a lot that go into them. And, and we're not going to cover a lot in this presentation outside of the, the thermoelectric cooler. Um, but there, there are certainly other options out there for either higher power or more degree of sub-ambient cooling. But those come with either higher power draw or <coughs> reliability um, concerns as well. So it's always a performance cost and reliability trade-off in these types of systems. Mm -hmm. So um, just going in a little more detail into the above ambient options, um, again, the fan filter, which seems to be the, the favorite in the crowd um, for, the, for the pros you see there, simple and inexpensive. It's, it's easy to integrate. It's easy to, um, to design in. But it does allow for maintenance costs in changing filters out, as well as the potential for dirt or water to enter your cabinet. And the sealed enclosure coolers, um, a higher degree of reliability. They do create that seal, and they can be used indoor, outdoor, and in a lot of different environments um, that have similar, similar limitations in terms of operating um, above ambient. So just to put a, a picture to kind of what's happening in, in both these scenarios. So in the fan filter, you're blowing air in using forced convection to cool your electronics and then letting the heat rise and exhaust out the top of your cabinet. In the sealed version, it's, it's a similar concept where you're using forced convection to um, cool the internal air within your system, pick up heat from the electronics, 
but you're circulating the air in such a way that you're concentrating it all in an internal heat sink, and then you're maintaining a seal at the enclosure um, and conducting through that seal just through metallic conduction and then dissipating on the external side. So you, you do have the ability to create that seal um, but still maintain good force convection within your, within your cabinet. And then obviously the, the benefit here is, is what we alluded to. In the fan filter combination, you have the potential to get dust or have to uh, change out filters frequently. And in the sealed enclosure cooler, you have a nice, clean operating cabinet. So with that, we'll talk about a, a couple different options for sealed enclosure coolers. The first one is the most simple. It's the what we call the heat sink cooler. And the name kind of speaks for itself. We're relying on a basic heat sink on both the inside and outside. We're <clears throat> using a, a, a mirrored fan heat sink combination. So on the inside, circulating the air, collecting the heat at that heat sink, conducting through the seal, and then on the outside using a very similar um, heat sink fan combination. So the benefits here are it's, it's a very simple design. Um, we select our fans to be the most reliable fans that are out there. We can also um, design our fin stack so we can create the fin pitch and thickness optimized for, for the fan that we select on there so you get good performance out of it. Um, but ultimately, the, the seal is what, what creates the, the high reliability here. The, the product offering here does come with um, several conductance options, and conductance that we'll talk about in the above ambient options is basically the amount of heat you can remove per degree C. So to make the math simple, if you have, um, if your internal air can operate 10 degrees above your, your external air, you can move with the HSC 68 option here, you can move 680 watts just from the, the heat sink cooler here. Um, you also get additional performance just convecting off the skin, so likely you can you can operate over 700 watts heat removal with the HSC 68. So talking about some customization options with this type of enclosure cooler, the the uh, first one that a lot of customers have have shown interest in is a direct mount HSC. So the benefit here is that instead of circulating air with inside your cabinet and having um, to cool the components have an air temperature rise and you're collecting that heat, you're directly mounting your components to the heat sink. So you cut out that, that convective heat transfer as part of your thermal resistance network internal to the cabinet. So this is really useful if you have one or two or a handful of components that are really generating a high percentage of your heat. You can mount them directly to the HSC and then you're just conducting through the, the seal and um, dissipating heat for, with the force convection heat sink on the outside. So it's a fairly simple modification. We take off the um, interior heat sink and fan combination and we add some mounting features that are customized for your electronic components to allow you to quickly mount them to that. And the second one that we're showing here is the high voltage application. Um, this happens in certain industries where you require some high voltage so this is, again, is a pretty straightforward customization where we go with a customized cover and add some additional electrical grounding and a fairly straightforward application here as well. The next enclosure cooler for above ambient cooling that we're going to talk about is the heat pipe cooler. So heat pipes, for, for those of you who are not familiar with them, they're passive two-phase heat transfer devices. So <clears throat> what that means is they're a closed loop system, so they add a high degree of reliability, um, but they really transport heat efficiently. So where metal has conduction of, say aluminum has conduction of around 160 watts per meter K, a heat pipe can be considered a superconductor and has over an order of magnitude greater effective thermal conductivity. And how it achieves that is it's wherever it's hotter in the system, so your internal air temperature will actually boil the fluid on the inside. It'll create a pressure gradient that'll push that, that vapor to wherever it's colder in the system, in this case, your, your external air temperature. And then that fluid will condense back to a liquid and use either a capillary wick structure or gravity to return back to the evaporator. But all in all, you get 
um, extremely efficient heat transfer, so you can take advantage of a lot more surface area in your system and reduce conduction gradient. So the HPC, just to give kind of a side view of how it works, um, we orient the, the fins in this image horizontally, and the heat pipes and, and fans are vertical, so we're blowing air over those fins, and then the heat pipes are picking up all the heat from the inside, transferring it to the outside, still maintaining that, that seal for reliability. But because the heat pipes are doing such an efficient job and, and are almost isothermal in their heat transfer, you have a very low heat flux into those fins, so that really drives performance, and it allows you to size your, your heat stick very compact. So this is a really good way to, uh, to have a compact um, surface area on your enclosure but still get very high performance out of it. And a similar uh, product family that we showed to the HSC, um, a series of conduction options that are basically scalable based on size. But again, the, the big benefit here is the small footprint on your enclosure and the ability to take advantage of the, the passive operation of the heat pipe to increase reliability. And there's two customized options that utilize two-phase heat transfer that we wanted to talk a little bit more about. So the first one is, is low noise. We occasionally get the need for customers to operate in environments where noise is a, is a big concern. So you don't want a really loud fan on the outside of your, of your enclosure. So in this case, by combining heat pipes with the internal components of, a, of an HSC, you can run the force convection inside, collect all the heat, and then on the outside, you use a natural convection heat sink. And if you're sizing a natural convection heat sink, you, you know you need to take advantage of much larger volumes um, to, for, for your fin surfaces. So with that, you need to efficiently conduct along that entire surface. So heat pipes, again, because they're superconductors, can short circuit that conduction path and allow you to operate uh, very high fin efficiency on a large a large natural convection heat sink. So for low noise applications, this is a, a really nice option that's, that's fairly straightforward to integrate heat pipes uh, within an enclosure core. And the, the second customized option is what we've seen a lot um, in the industry for extremely high power control cabinets. So <clears throat> the loop thermosiphon is a variant of, of the heat pipe which runs in a, in a full loop system. So it's a, it's a direct mount option where the uh, two flat surfaces you can see on both images are called the evaporator and components are mounted directly to those. And that's actually driving the, the vaporization internal to the loop thermosiphon. The vapor is going up a single line, it's condensing at the, the heat sink which is remotely located, and then the liquid return is down a separate line. And that's key in this application because you have no cross flow within the uh, transport lines. So that allows you to move an extreme amount of power. Um, and again, it's a fairly scalable technology. So we've done these systems in hundreds of watts all the way up to um, over 50 kilowatts in, in certain applications. But the big benefit here is that it adds a lot of packaging flexibility. So you can remotely locate your, your heat sink or your condenser fairly far away from, <coughs> from the evaporator and you can incorporate things like flex lines that you see there on the image to the, to the left. Those orange lines are, are flex lines and that allows you to easily integrate these into your cabinet. So if, in very tightly packaged cabinets, this is a, a really nice way to move a lot of heat and get it out of your system. So that covers some of the, the standard and customized options for above ambient. As I said, that's the, the bulk of our uh, presentation, but we will touch on just some uh, just briefly on some subambient cooling options. Um, the three here are the, the main ones that, that we see in the, in the industry. Liquid to air heat exchanger. So this is a high performance uh, cooling system and it also is fairly compact, but it does require a source of chilled water or a, or a chiller in the system. The thermoelectric cooler, this is a solid state application, so low power draw, but it does have some limitation on, on total power removal in the system, but that's one that is more in line with, with some of the above ambient options that we'll, we'll talk through here. And then the final one is, is um, using basically an air conditioner with a compressor, and that um, is, is used 
pretty frequently, gives you a high coefficient of performance, but it does have um, high energy consumption and, and provides some reliability concerns. So, like I said, we won't go into all those options, but if you do have questions on anything not covered, feel free to, to ask and, and we'll certainly get your response. But we, we will touch on the thermoelectric coolers in more detail. Um, just one quick slide here. The, the thermoelectric air conditioners, <clears throat> they're a really nice solution for um, kind of low, low power applications. So they can hold um, and they can be dialed in for kind of precise temperature control within your cabinet by um, by using the, the Peltier cooler, the thermoelectric, to control temperature. And the two options you see here, the 90 and 300, those numbers um, correspond to how much heat can be removed with zero delta T. So your internal air is going to be exactly the same temperature as your external air, um, but you can get 90 watts of heat removal with the TEC90 or 300 watts with the TEC300. And the charts you see there are the, the performance curves, which are, are linear, and you can move <coughs> um, more heat above ambient and, and slightly less heat subambient. So again, it, it provides you a nice reliable option um, for those low power subambient cooling applications. And the final slide um, we have here before Scott will take some questions is some of the resources available. So, we do have a fairly robust uh, website with field enclosure cooling information, so feel free to jump on there. There's a lot more information on, on all these solutions. Um, the one thing that we would like to highlight is the selection tool that you see there to the right. This um, basically takes all the engineering considerations we talked about in today's webinar, and it'll actually calculate um, not only the conductance requirement, which, which you can calculate with, with your components, but it also take into consideration the amount of heat you removed off the enclosure skin itself. So it'll be able to provide you an option, taking both those things into consideration, um, and provide you options for your above ambient cooling. Um, and then all the off-the-shelf products, we do have step files, um, so CAD files available for download, and you can fit them into your, your CAD models or higher-level assembly models um, to make sure it fits and it's not uh, protruding with any electronics. So with that, uh, I'll pass it over. I want to thank everyone for, for joining again and appreciate all the questions that have been coming in. And I'll pass it over to Keith and Scott for Q&A. Well, thanks, Brian. Yes, thanks, uh, thanks everybody, for submitting questions. I encourage, um, uh, if you've got additional questions, to go ahead and type them into that bo box to the left. We've, um, we've got a few minutes to address as many as we can. So. Uh, please have at it. But I think what I'll do is I'll shift gears and um, maybe throw some questions here uh, Scott's way. Um, first, we've got a question on, do you have units that do both cooling and heating? Um, obviously, they're going to be more, exp <laughs> more expensive than one or the other. But do you have, uh, is, that, is that a customization yeah. option that you often uh, fulfill? Yes, yeah. I can talk to that. Our, um, our, our rise above ambient, Coolers um, typically do not have a heating option, so our heat pipes, uh, heat pipe coolers, HPCs, and our uh, conduction units um, typically do not come with heaters, but it's very easily to, easy to integrate a heater into the cabinet um, separately with its own temperature controller to provide some additional heat if required in very cold ambient conditions. Our TEC coolers do have an option to run the, the voltage um, across the thermoelectrics to provide heating inside the cabinet as well. So it's an option for the TEC coolers. It is not an option on our, our heat pipe and our conduction cooled heat sinks. Yeah, so I guess the thermoelectric effect works works just fine yeah, backwards. We, we just reverse the voltage on those, yep. Put a controller yeah. in for them. Great. Um, here's another question. Um, what about Venturi type cabinet coolers? Is mm -hmm. that something yeah. that you're familiar yeah, with a, and that you have as well? That's a different type of cooler. Um, it re, re, relies on um, high pressure, high velocity uh, air going through a Venturi. Uh, it works well. It's good for um, cabinets in industrial settings where you have a already pre-plumbed um, high, high flow compressed air solution. 
uh, outdoor mm -hmm. cabinets, cabinets that are in shelters or other places where you don't have a readily available compressed airflow, um, it's, it's less viable. And they're also mm -hmm. pretty efficient, inefficient in the power used to compress and flow the air versus the cooling effect that you get. But they're, they're mm -hmm. out there. They're uh, certainly an option. I would imagine they're pretty reliable as well, as long as your compressed air supply remain, <laughs> remains reliable. Right. If, if, if your compressed air and then filtering through the venturi is, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Um, let me see what else do we have here. I keep those questions coming on in. Um, more of a, a kind of a, a, a um, I guess, a qualitative question. Uh, what is the size of, of those heat pipes? I guess trying to get a sense of how, um, you know, what, it's a little little tough with some of the pictures to tell how big the heat pipes sure. are, but maybe you yeah. can qualify that a little bit of, of how big the individual pipes are sure. and an assembly. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I'm not sure which ones they're referring to. In our heat pipe, um, heat exchangers, it's an array of 3 8 inch diameter heat pipes, so they're pretty small diameter, but they go up through the fins at, at pretty close spacing. If they were talking about mm -hmm. the loop thermosiphons that um, Brian was showing, they, those diameters range uh, on the amount of power. But some of those were doing, um, I'd say, you know, five to ten kilowatts and half inch to three quarter inch tubes, one for vapor, one for liquid, exiting the cabinet. Okay, great. Um, what are some special considerations for outdoor control panels installed at higher elevations? with variable high and low ambient temperatures throughout the year? Yep. Um, again, certainly similar to the question asked, if it's very low ambience, you may want to require some heating. If your electronics mm -hmm. are sufficient, heat it up, and, and it would run too cold. And your uh, depends what you're doing. Some electronics aren't impacted by that. Some performance varies if they're too cold. Higher elevations, mm -hmm. obviously, you do get derated performance because the atmosphere thins. So if you're very high up, um, you need to consider the mm -hmm. derate on both the inside and outside heat exchangers of the uh, okay. coolers for your cabinet. That makes sense. Um, let me see here. Um, can a vapor chamber be combined with a thermosiphon? Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but I'll let you answer. The, 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 whoever asked that question has been doing some research on. Uh, Heat tanks, but uh, yeah, vapor okay. chambers are typically used to convert very high heat fluxes off a high power, very small footprint device uh, into a lower yeah. heat flux and allow that to then be cooled by a uh, less aggressive type heat sink. So they can be, um, they may not necessarily um, be required because the loop thermosiphons that we were showing can handle fairly high heat fluxes. So. Um, in any case, it would be a custom design, um, but yeah, you can certainly couple a vapor chamber spreader with a loop thermosiphon solution. Okay, great. Um, question, is there any specific type of heat pipe, and if so, what is what would be its dimensions? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure what he's okay. referring to there. Um, I mean, there's heat pipes yeah. all over the range from two millimeter up to, you know, large diameter of various lengths. Um, if he's talking about our, our enclosure coolers, our heat pipe solution for heat pipe enclosure coolers, we have uh, a product, a family of four different configurations there um, of various sizes. So you, you could just look to see what uh, what would work best mm -hmm. for your cat in that condition. That's a kind of related question on, on the HPC. Do these work if they're mounted on the side of an enclosure? Yeah. Yep. So for the heat pipe coolers, it is relying, um, it, it is a thermosiphon, so the fluid is returned by gravity. So they work mm -hmm. best when they're mounted on top. They do work when they're mounted on the side, but we have a, a D rating of about 15% of the performance. Um, alternatively, okay. if you don't have room on the top and you have, um, you have to mount it on the side, you want the full power, we have a little mounting kit that bolts to the cabinet and tilts it at a slight angle so you get the full performance back. Okay, great. Um, and are there options uh, where enclosure coolers do not protrude into the enclosure? So I guess to 
if you want to preserve yeah. uh, preserve your real estate within the within the box, are there options where the, the electronics are, are external to the enclosure itself? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, most of the uh, enclosure coolers you see will have a, a mounting plate in the center of the cooler so that some fins are inside and some fins are external um, of that divider plate. But again, there's options where you can buy a custom um, mounting system that will mount to your cabinet and bump that flange out so that the entire uh, enclosure cooler heatsink is external to your cabinet. But that's a again a custom an add-on feature to mount it to your cabinet with that extension to move the, the enclosure cooler all to the exterior side of your existing cabinet. We got one last question here about um, what is the working fluid for the heat pipe cooler and loop thermo thermosiphon, yeah. and are there concerns with large operating temperature ranges? Yeah, for the um, the. Heat pipe enclosure cooler, methanol is the working fluid, so uh, it'll continue functioning very cold, low temperature, low ambient temperatures, um, mm -hmm. and it works well up through warm ambience as well. Um, for the loop thermosiphons, for those types of solutions, we typically will use a refrigerant, which again takes away any issues with um, low operating temperatures. Gotcha. All right. Um, I think that's all the questions we've had coming in. Last uh, last call for questions. If somebody's uh, re re resisted hitting the, the enter button until now, uh, and now's your last chance to get this, these answered live. If not, if you have additional questions, or if you happen to come back to the interface and and want to um, submit something, we'll be looking at all those questions. And then, if, if there's additional questions that um, aren't answered here uh, during the live uh, session. Then we will um, we will answer those by email. Oh, we got one more come in. All right, one more. Um, can you recommend a product that integrates condensation control in addition to cooling heating control for a panel? Um, yeah, you, with any of these, um, you can integrate controls in the cabinet to prevent condensation, either by um, monitoring existing conditions and not overcooling it. Or uh, with our TEC, our subambient coolers, or, or any type, many types of air conditioners as well for cabinets. Um, the coolest part in the cabinet will be the condensing the fin um, mm -hmm. on the inside. So you'll condense there, and many times there's a drip tray with a vent tube that allows that condensate to run safely out of the cabinet without um, getting on any electronics. So there's two ways of doing that. Um, deliberately condense on the cool spot on the fins and collect that and vent it out, or um, just make, do, do controls based on the um, conditions inside the cabinet so you don't overcool to get condensation. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, another question came in. Uh, what is the pressure inside a loop thermosiphon? I think just trying to get a sense of yeah. what kind of operating the pressure, pressure does inside, have. Yeah, the pressure inside any heat pipe or loop thermosiphon is set by the, the saturation pressure of the working fluid. So it depends what working fluid. In our heat pipes with methanol, um, it'll be atmospheric pressure at 65 degrees C operating temperature and subambient below there. Um, refrigerant, it depends on what refrigerant you're using. Um, so we designed that, that you know everything is, will be within a safe operating pressure over the design temperatures. Okay, great. And one last question here. What is the minimum heat that can be dissipated with ACT products? Um, I, I don't know that there is a minimum. If there's a temperature <laughs> gradient, they're pulling heat. Yeah. If it's a small gradient, we'll move very little heat. Um, right. So I, w I would say there's probably not a necessarily a minimum. Um, nothing really turns on at a has to get superheated yeah. or you know heated up before something turns on particularly for our conduction um, enclosure coolers. Okay, great. And if, um, let me just maybe wrap up by, by saying uh, if people have more specific questions and, and need to do some calculations around matching a, a, a particular product or a custom product to their specific application needs, what, where should they go to pursue uh, more information on that or to get, get, get help? Brian? Yeah, sure. You can certainly reach out uh, through our website. We will 
we'll certainly be um, answering any questions that come through our website or through this, this platform here as well. So yeah, reach out if, if you reference that uh, you attended the webinar. We'll certainly make sure it's a, a priority to get your response as quick as possible. All right, great. Well, I think that's all the, all the questions we have coming in. So with that, I think we'll try to draw things to a close. I'd really like to thank Scott and Brian, as well as our, our sponsor, Advanced Cooling Technologies, for our webinar. And of course, all of you who took the time to join our webinar today. Within 24 hours or so, we'll send you a notice that this webinar is available for on-demand viewing, and we encourage you to share it with colleagues who you think might find it useful. And finally, please, please stay tuned just for a few minutes after we wrap up the, um, the webinar to answer a brief survey that will appear on your screen. They'll, they'll really, your answers will really help us to craft um, webinars that will be benefit you in the future. Um, so thank you all for your time and attention. And have a great day. Thanks, uh, Brian. Thanks, uh, thanks Scott. And uh, we will see you, everybody, next time. Take care. Thank, Thank you, everyone. For thanks, guys. Bye.